I would love to preach a sermon about why God's will was veiled from the beginning to the end. Amen. Why heaven, because most of us think that heaven has it all figured out. No, heaven's watching the will of God play out in front of its own eyes. Heaven is much bigger and co more complicated than most of us were taught. And I'm looking at the Bible going, how did I not see this? And why didn't anyone ever teach this? There's some really fun, deep things. But the reason we're not going to talk about that today is because we need to answer the number one question most people are asking. How do I know what the will of God is from my life? That's what we want to ask. So today we're going to focus a little bit on this. And what does that look like? So the first thing I want you to do, I want you to turn with me. Let's start in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Do we have these verses on the screen? Uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read to you a few examples and then we're going to talk about them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's start reading back in verse 14. This is Paul obviously writing to the church in Thessalonica. If you go there, they will tell you you're pronouncing it wrong. It's Thessaloniki. Whatever. <clears throat> it's all Greek to me. And it, verse 14, Paul is writing to the church that he helped plant. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but the wrath has come upon them at last. Woof. Now, let's just dive into that for a second. I lied to you. We, we got to talk about this for a second before we move on. We're going to stay right here for a moment. What Paul is telling them and what he's revealing is that he got evicted from Thessalonica against his will and against God's will. Be honest. God's desire was for him to be there and to preach the good news, but he encountered opposition from people that did not want people to hear the gospel so that they would become saved. If you don't think that you going out and doing evangelism is going to encounter opposition, you're crazy. Now, the problem is, is sometimes you encounter opposition and you think that that's the will of God. No, you need to remember there's an enemy of our souls that does not want people to hear the good news. you got to suit up, toughen up, and get out there and be willing to take some punches and throw some punches. Amen? Amen. Because the enemy will try hard to stop you. And forgive me for being kind of blunt here. If you're a wuss and all it takes is one hit to knock you down... Come on, get back up and get back in the fight. Let's go. When the enemy throws a punch, don't you lay down and stay down. You get back up and you fight. Now, this, now watch what Paul says next. Because Paul knows that this is not God's will that he is getting opposed with. He says it's the people, but then he's going to attribute it to Satan. But watch what happens. It looks like they're winning. It looks like the devil is winning. He's prevailing and keeping the gospel from coming. And then Paul says, but wrath has come upon them at last. So when you face opposition, that's not the Lord. It's the devil coming to stop you. And people are partnering with the devil. They might not even know it, but they're partnering with the devil. What happens is God will allow the opposition and give them time to repent because he's merciful and good. And you might say, God, why are you allowing this? Because he's merciful and good, and he's giving them a chance to repent before the wrath comes. But the wrath will come. And now the people that opposed it, the wrath of God was coming upon them. Now keep reading, verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, notice the words torn. We didn't want to go. We were torn, ripped away from you. For a short time, in person, but not in heart, we endeavored more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. 
I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, what's interesting to me in this, these few verses is he was talking about people, 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 and now he attributes it to Satan. Because you need to understand that when you face sometimes people, they're partnering with the devil that's strategically stirring them up to come against you. Because he knows what will happen if the gospel comes into that city. Everything the devil was doing will be undone. He doesn't want that to happen. So what's your job? To understand that when the enemy is opposing you, that is not the will of God, and it is not time to give up. Amen. Now let's, I'm going to show you what was going on. Let's flip to Acts chapter 17. I don't think you have this one on the screen, but you do have Acts 16, and we're going to get there in just a moment. So Acts chapter 17, if you could flip there with me. Acts chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous taking some wicked men of the rabble and formed a mob set in the city and uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another King Jesus, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now, what we see here, this is what Paul is referencing in 1 Thessalonians. Remember when I was torn from you? It's because the people formed a mob, a strategy. They went to the authorities. The authorities agreed with the mob, and they decided to come after Paul and Silas. And Jason, being a wise man, hid them and sent them out by night to protect them. So sometimes when you face opposition of the enemy, there is cause to withdraw for a moment before you re-enter. Don't be the cowboy that says, whatever's going to happen, here we go, guns a-blazing. Because you need to understand there is, in spiritual warfare, retreating for a moment is not the same thing as giving up. Paul was not giving up. He was pulling away to re-enter, just as we read in 1 Thessalonians. I'm trying to come again and again, but Satan is opposing me. Now what you see here is... You see physical actions of people happening. So how do you know if it's God or people or the devil or a mixture of things happening? We're, I'm glad you asked because we're going to get there. Let's flip backwards to Acts chapter 16. It says this in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. And I'm pretty sure we do have this one on the screen if you don't have your Bible. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Again, this is talking of Paul and his entourage. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now we see a contrast here. We see a moment where it's never wrong to preach the gospel unless the Holy Spirit tells you not to. So why would the Holy Spirit tell them not to? Doesn't the Holy Spirit want the world to hear the gospel? And the thing I want to tell you is sometimes we take faith and we think that faith makes us the boss of God instead of faith giving us the strength to do the will of God. You see, faith should cause a greater submission in our life to the Lord. It should say, God, I surrender to your will. And if I don't know what your will is, I'm just going to go until you direct me and then I'll know. I'm not going to sit idle and do nothing and wait and wait and wait and wait. Paul was in motion. He wasn't sitting in Jerusalem going, well, God, someday I, I know you, you called me on the road to Damascus to do this, but I need another sign. You know, when, when am I supposed to go? Where do you want me to go? Hey, Lord, I just, I'll just wait here until I know. If it's God's will, it will be. 
That's not what he did. Instead, what he did was he put into motion what he knew he was called to do. And listen to me, as he went, God directed him. You know, a boat that has no engine can only be steered if it's in motion. It has to be moving in order for it to be steered. So if you want God to direct your life, the first thing you need to do is start moving towards what you already know is right. Just go and do what you already know. Don't sit at home and wait. Go and do what you already know is right. And watch how God, hi buddy, watch how God directs your footsteps. Because this was not the devil telling him to stop. This was the Holy Spirit. Now let's keep reading. It says, And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. That's interesting. Now, it doesn't tell us why, and we're not going to sit and talk about why today, but what I want you to see again and again is that God was directing something that was in motion. And there is a difference between discerning between what is the devil opposing you and God directing you. Because we just read one chapter difference of Satan hindering the gospel and God saying you actually need to be quiet as you go through this region. Because God knew something was going on and God was protecting him. So you're not going to have faith outside the will of God. Let me just say that. If God asks you to do something, you're like, no, God, I've got faith. Good luck with that. What it says next is very interesting. In verse 8, so Paul might have been saying, okay, God, if you don't want us to preach the gospel here and you don't want us to go any farther that direction, what do you want us to do then? Verse 8, so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now what you see is God redirecting. But I want to emphasize that God is redirecting something that's in motion. If you are idle water, you're going to constantly live with the, the calling in your heart saying, I feel like I'm called to, but you're never going to get there without motion. I want to encourage you today, do what you know is right and let God steer the ship. He might stop you and redirect you. That's not him punishing Paul. Paul was not afraid of stepping outside of the will of God. Why are we? Why are we? We live in this absolute fear that if I do something that's not the will of God, then it's not going to go well, so I'm scared to try because I'm scared to fail. And I want to remove that mindset from you because sometimes God calls you to do something and the result is not up to you. Matthew chapter 10, you can turn there if you want, when Jesus takes the 12 disciples and he says, all right, it's time to go out two by two into the cities. You're going to kick out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, let's go. You're not going to take money for your services in, in terms of charging them, but you're going to receive if they take an offering from you. You're going to go and trust me that I will take care of you as you go. And if a city rejects you, shake the dust off your feet and keep going. Did he say, if a city rejects you, you weren't supposed to go there, and that wasn't my will, you screwed up? That's not what he said. Instead, he said, go and preach the gospel. And if they reject you, you are still doing what I asked you to do because the results are not up to you. Your job is obedience. And when you go, where you go, when you're preaching the gospel, when I've told you to go, if they reject it, that is not a sign of you being outside the will of God. So we fear rejection, like maybe I did this and it wasn't the right time or it wasn't, it wasn't God's thing. And, and I said, just let that junk go. Just let it go. Be free. <laughs> let, let's just set the captives free today, okay? And what I want you to understand is that you're living probably under this weight of fear that if I don't have the will of God figured out every line item in detail, then I'm going to paralyze and not do anything. Why don't you just go and watch God direct you? Because what you're going to see is that as you go, he will direct you. If people reject you, reject, he'll direct you to places of fruitfulness. 
Just like he said, hey, hey, here's a vision of a guy in Macedonia. And even then, not every detail was laid out. That's why it says, we concluded that God was calling us to Macedonia. He saw the vision, went, all right, guys, I guess we're supposed to go there. Even though the vision didn't say, thus saith the Lord, go to Macedonia. (laughs) Come on, man. And what we see here is God was redirecting him for reasons we don't understand and we don't need to. Amen. All we need to do is be obedient. That's it. That's the key, the secret sauce. If you don't know, then keep going until you do know. Because God will direct you. He will direct you. But get going so that he can direct you. Otherwise, what happens is it's idle hope. It's an idle dream that, that's not going anywhere. It's an engine that's been turned on and it's sitting in neutral. It's not going in reverse. It's not going forward. It's not doing anything but running and sitting there and waiting for someone to take the controls and do something. So you might be saying, okay, how do I know then when it's God redirecting me and when it's the devil opposing me? Because there's sometimes similar signs. You know, I'm looking in the natural. Uh, there's, there's a people opposing me here, and it's the devil. Then there's people not receiving it here, and it's the Holy Spirit directing. How do I know the difference? And here's how you know the difference. You pray for the gift of discernment to interpret the spirit behind the natural circumstance. So let, let me explain that. When you come up against something that you're saying, whoa, what's, what's happening here? Was this the will of God? Did I make a mistake here? What's going on? There's, those are valid questions, but I, w- I don't want you to start there. I want you to start here. What spirit is behind the natural circumstances? Because when you pray for discernment and you can see demonic stuff behind the circumstances, then it's pretty obvious, right? And when you see the Holy Spirit behind the circumstances, that's pretty obvious. Now, I, I want to say this. The Holy Spirit more often directs from within and then confirms from outside, whereas the devil just attacks you from the outside. So let's be honest. It's pretty obvious that if the Holy Spirit is your counselor, your guide, trust him. Trust him. He will confirm. Now, I want to, I'm I'm going to make a few more points here that I hope are very helpful, but what I want you to stop thinking is if I fail, then it wasn't the will of God. If Paul walked in here, he would be laughing at that. He'd be saying, really? You know how many times I was stoned or I was thrown in jail and, and people tried to kill me? You, y'all are going to play that card? I don't think so. He, we wouldn't get a green card on this. Paul would be saying, you get stoned, you get back up, you go back in the city. That's what he would say. Because he was so extreme and so on fire that no matter what the devil brought, he was coming against the devil just as hard. So we got to stop living in fear of this imaginary cage of the will of God and just say, you know what? I'm going to charge forward. And nothing's going to stop me unless the Lord redirects me. Stop fearing failure. Just stop it. God is going to call you to do things where the results are not up to you. And if the results are great, praise Jesus. If they're not great, then you were still obedient. Amen? Because if obedience is the goal, then who cares what anyone else thinks about you? I'm just going to share this with you very quickly. When when we went to Brazil last year, we did two crusades, just like we're going to do this year, but we're going to two different cities. And last year, we what we do is we gather close to a thousand volunteers from all the local churches so that they can help us do the work of the ministry. Where our goal is not to do an event and drop a bomb and walk away. It's actually to form discipleship net to bring people into the body of Christ. So we train for three nights all of these people from the churches that are volunteering to help us at the crusade. And because the Holy Spirit is the same on stage as he is off stage, we practice with the volunteers. Because I'm not against lights and smoke and all this stuff, but that's not necessary for the Holy Spirit to move. So we just let the people know, we're going to practice this right now. We're going to practice healing, deliverance, all the things. And so by the third night, we'd already done healing and deliverance. People were getting saved. 
healed. Everything was great, right? Everyone, and it's growing in volunteers every night because they're hearing miracles are happening just in the training. Praise Jesus. So it grows. And on the last night, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what happened. Something broke loose and I have no idea how or why it just did. It was the Holy Spirit through and through. And we just kind of said, let it happen. Let this thing roll. I'm talking the whole crowd was up at the altar, and there were more demons coming out, and there were people getting healed. There was a lady with this big lump in her breast, and she had just got a test done by the doctor, and she was living in fear of the results coming because she was afraid it was breast cancer, and it completely disappeared. She said she felt the power of God go through her body. She came, she came on stage, and she was crying. Can you imagine, especially the women in this room, can you imagine the fear that you'd be contending with? And then all of a sudden, Jesus just heals you? That's impressive, man. She came on stage and she was weeping. And while she's sharing this testimony, there's demons coming out over here. There's people getting free. And we just stood there and went, all right. No one has the microphone right now. We're just ministering and letting the Lord do his thing. It was so cool. It was like the top just blew off, and here we go. Yeah, now, I want to say this. You can't program the Holy Spirit. So when moments like that happen, just ride it, man. Just ride the wave. And so we were riding the wave. We walked away from that. The volunteers were walking away going, look what God did tonight. Man. You want to know how excited we were for the crusade? We were like, man, if that's what God's doing in the training, you just wait for the crusade. So the very next night was the first night of the crusade. And people are showing up. The the audience is filling up. I think that night we had close to 5,000 people show up, but almost no volunteers. And we went, where's the volunteers? We need them. That's the whole point of this. And we pulled a few of the volunteers aside. A a few of them were pastors. And we said, where is everyone? And they said, well, all the pastors were so offended by what happened last night that they're holding emergency church services in their church to keep their people from coming. And they're undoing everything that God did. Wow. Talk about living in denial. I I was blown away. So we operated with a crowd of 5,000 people on a skeleton crew. We got her done, baby. Praise (laughs) Jesus. But let's say it was a long night. There There was a lot of demons that came out that night, a lot of good things that the Lord did. So why am I sharing this story? What I'm trying to show you is that in progress, you might not do anything wrong. God might actually show up in a way that is undeniable and it offends a religious spirit. We were not outside the will of God. What we were experiencing was offense that came from the enemy and it was stirring things up and it didn't stop the crowd from coming. It just hindered our volunteer base and we just said, all right, shake the dust off our feet. We're going to help the people that are here. You've got to let go of fear. When you struggle with the fear that, but what if I do this and it doesn't work? Who cares? The question you should be asking is, am I being obedient? Because... At the end of this life, when you stand before Jesus, he's not going to say, hey, did you get everyone saved that I led you to? That's not what he's going to say. He's going to say, did you share the gospel with everyone I asked you to? He's not going to say it's up to you whether they got saved or not, because it's not up to you. It's up to them. They are an independent, free will being that gets to make a choice just like you and I. Our job is to present the gospel, and invite them into the kingdom of God. And they might say no, and then you share it again. (laughs) And what you need to understand is that inside of this, stop worrying about being outside the will of God and just move and let God direct you. He will direct you. So when you have circumstances that are happening, your job is to pray for discernment, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gift of discerning between spirits. God, I'm seeing these circumstances. Maybe your car is breaking down. Maybe you're having tons of technical difficulties and you're starting to wonder, is this a demonic attack or is this God telling us not to do this? Here's how you discern. You ask for discernment. 
There is a gift of discernment, discerning the spirits. And you say, Lord, show me what's behind this. And once you know the spirit behind it, it becomes very evident whether God is redirecting you or whether it's the devil trying to stop you. And if it's the devil trying to stop you, just ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? And if it's the Lord redirecting you, ask the same question. God, what do you want me to do? Okay, if you don't want me to go this way, do you want me to go to Macedonia like Paul? What do I need to do? I'll do it. But God will redirect you. God didn't leave Paul sitting out there in Asia with no direction. He redirected him to a place of fruitfulness. Because God will not waste your time in terms of sending you somewhere that's not his, his will. He's going to draw you into places. And if they don't receive it, that's not your problem. But he's going to draw you to places. And sometimes when there's places like Macedonia or Nineveh or whatever, God will bring you there because they're ready. And there's other places he will send you to present it anyway. And if they don't receive it, at least they had a chance. So stop Worrying about the results proving whether it was the will of God or not. I, I meet, I, I'm, a, I'm a counselor. I do lots of marriage counseling. I do lots of personal counseling. And this is the question that a lot of people face. They, they're one, I'm not against people asking this question, just so you know. A lot of people become paralyzed by analysis. Paralysis by analysis. Am I supposed to marry this one? Is this the one? Is this the one? And, and I flip it on them and I say, hey, you should pray. You should ask the Lord, man, is this a good decision or not? Am I a good fit for this person? But you know what else you should, you, you, the conclusion you should come to? Do I love who this person is? And do I want to pour out my life loving them well? Is this a person I want to run with? That's very different, isn't it? Because here's the question. If you marry someone... And later it doesn't work out and they leave you and there was truly nothing you could do. You might be saying, see, I never should have married them in the first place. It wasn't the will of God. You don't know that. Number one, you don't know that. And number two, even if it started as the will of God, they can choose at any moment to rebel. And so can you. If you don't believe me, read the story of King Saul. God gave him a new heart. God gave him a heart after him, and Saul started well and ended poorly. So there's proof that God can give someone a new heart, and they can turn away from it. You could marry someone that's an amazing person, that's doing good, and they can fall off the tracks because they can choose to. So stop stop it. Just stop with this whole, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I, you know what you need to be asking? I don't know. Uh, what the will is in this situation other than I'm going to love well. I'm going to love like Jesus. And I'm not going to become so confused with the things I can't explain that I'm just, that it stops me from doing what I do know. Man, I, I lived it. My, my first wife left. She was just up and gone. Had an affair, was gone. There was literally nothing I could do. And I'll share that story with you a different day. But when she left, man, I faced a whole lot of criticism from the church. A lot of people came to me and said, what did you do wrong? And I went, what? What? She cheated on me. She left. She started doing a lot of things that are not godly. And you're looking at me and asking me what I did wrong? Wow. Well, you know, it takes two to tangle. You no, know, actually... It, it takes two to have a marriage. It only takes one to have a divorce. So shut up. <laughs> it is possible for you to do the right things and still not have the results you want. So the question of the day is, am I being obedient? Am I being like Jesus as much as I can be and continuing to grow in that walk with Christ? That's the questions you should be asking. And then you're still free to say, God, direct me. If I'm going the wrong way, just direct me because I want to follow you. I want your will on this earth. So I'm going, Jesus. And as I go, you direct me where you want me to go. Those are the questions you should be asking. Now, let me prove it to you. I, I talked about this longer than I wanted to. Let's flip back to the main scripture I want to go to. We could literally flip to a whole bunch of places 
to illustrate point after point after point on how this plays out. But I got to choose one. So this is where we're going to land. This is 1 Samuel chapter 23. I'm pretty sure we have that one on the screen. I'm reading in the ESV, if, uh, if you have the option back there, Elijah. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. Now they told David, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? The first thing I want to point out here is when David didn't know the answer, what did he do? He asked the Lord. When you don't know what to do, you start there. Ask the Lord. Don't call your prophet friend. Don't call all the people. Ask the Lord. Did you know that you can go directly to the Lord and the Holy Spirit's in you? I'm I'm not against you asking people to pray or someone having a word from the Lord. I'm just telling you, I get burned out from people that refuse to get on their knees and talk to Jesus on their own. They want me to do it for them. I'm sick of it. Get you on your own knees. My knees are worn out, man. So the first thing David does is he inquires of the Lord. Because he's not sure what's going on here. He knows the odds are stacked against him. He only has like 600 men against however many people were with the Philistines. And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Now, I didn't do a good job setting the tone here. This is before David actually assumed the throne, and he's still running from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. So his, his guys, his chief men, are saying, we're scared for our lives every day, and now you want us to march down there and attack the Philistines? Oh, my goodness. You want us to go in harm's way? And the first thing I want to point out in this scripture is this that fear is not discernment. It never has been, it never will be. But we spiritualize it, don't we? I'm afraid, I don't want to do it, so I'm going to tell you that God told me not to go. Preach it loud. Preach it loud, I like this guy. Come on, let's go. I'm going to say it again. Fear is not and never has been discernment. It is not going to guide you to the will of God. It's not going to give you strength to do the will of God. It's only going to keep you from having faith to do what God is asking you to do. That's it. It never has been. That's the reason Paul clarifies, hey, God has not given you a spirit of fear. So if you are calling fear discernment, you're wrong. And you need to be honest with yourself. If you're feeling fear and you, you act like, uh, I got to check in my spirit, but you know it's fear and it's not the Holy Spirit, be honest. Don't lie to yourself and call that the Holy Spirit. I know what a check from the Holy Spirit feels like and I know what fear feels like. And I have made the mistake of trying to justify fear never again. Because I have seen in live action what that fear was trying to keep me from. Never again. Never again. I will not be guided by a spirit of fear. It is not discernment. So these guys were afraid. That's not the will of God. God told them his will straight up, and they were still afraid to do what God was asking them to do. So don't think there aren't going to be times when you have to choose to confront the fear that is trying to keep you from doing God's will. Now let's keep reading. It says, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. What's important to understand here is that as David was ready to go, his men weren't. So David said, Okay, If you think I made a mistake, I'll just ask the Lord again. Notice God's patience here. That God didn't rain down judgment on them because he just needed some reassurance for his men. So when you're feeling fear, it's okay to say, God, I just need you. I'm feeling some fear and I just need you one more time to tell me that this is really what you need me to do. 
But in that same token, eventually you have to make a choice. You can't sit there forever. You can't ask for a thousand different signs and think that, okay, uh, now that I have a thousand and one signs, I'm finally convinced. There comes a time when you have to just say, okay, this is what God has called us to do. Let's go. Now, in this situation, it was time sensitive. And I want to point out, it is possible for you to miss what God has for you in this season. If you allow fear to inhibit you from doing what God has asked you to do, it is possible for you to miss what God has for you in this season. If you allow fear to reign in your heart. So it's really important that you never justify fear. Fear is not discernment. It's not the will of God. It is not the spirit of God. It's the spirit of the world. Okay, so let's keep reading. Now, when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. For those of you that don't know what the ephod was, this was the priestly garment that they used to consult the Lord. So they would pray, and if God didn't come down in physical form and speak to them, this was how they talked to the Lord. The the high priest wore this ephod and there were 12 stones on it and all these different things. We won't take the time to fully describe it, but they would pray and the Lord would answer them by lighting up these stones or using the different things on it. So David calls Abimelech and says, hey, uh, it's interesting that you brought the ephod down here. Verse 7, now it was told to Saul that David had come to Keilah and Saul said, God has given him into my hand. For he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. I'm going to pause here for a second to point out something that's really interesting. Saul actually thought God was on his side. Woof. Don't let that be you. Don't you oppose the will of God for so much for so long that you can't even tell when you're opposing God and what he's trying to do. Remember those pastors in Brazil I told you about? I, I bet you they actually thought that they were partnering with God's will to come against the crusade. I think they honestly thought that. I'm, I'm not trying to throw shade on them, but they allowed a religious spirit to stir them up and they had this self-righteousness that made them think, we are doing this for the Lord. And if you don't believe me, just read the gospel accounts where the people thought they were doing the will of God by killing Jesus, by killing Stephen, by killing all these other people. Remember Paul when he was Saul and he was killing Christians in the name of God because he actually believed he was doing the will of God. Don't become that person. Don't become that person. Don't oppose the, the, the Lord so much that you can't even tell if you're on his side. So Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now, why was David in Keilah? Because God directed him to go save the people of Keilah. So there's no question that David's in the right place, right? But here's something really interesting. Verse 9, David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Now this brings up my next point. If you don't know, ask. Notice I didn't say, if you don't know, guess. <laughs> if you don't know, ask. Uh, the people in counseling hear me say this all the time. Stop creating narratives and just ask. <laughs> if you don't know something that you want to know, ask. This, is, this, will, this will save your marriage, trust me. If you're ever in a moment in your marriage where you're like, my wife did that on purpose to hurt me, stop creating that narrative and just say, I don't know why she did that. So you know what? If I really want to know, I'm going to ask. Simple, isn't it? That'll prevent a lot of conflict in your marriage. And you know what? It'll, it'll save you a lot when you're seeking out the will of God as well. Because look what David does. He knows he's in Keilah by the direction of God. But when he hears that Saul is coming, he says, I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm going to ask. So he grabs the priest and the ephod, and he asks the Lord the question. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. 
And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. And when Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop there for a second and just point out a couple interesting things. They're interesting to me. If you're bored, don't worry. Bruce is going to preach it up next week, and it's going to be awesome. Here's what's interesting. God foreknew two things that never happened. I'm going to say that again. God foreknew two things that never happened. The Lord could see in the future, and he said, you know what, David? Saul is going to come down, and the people of the city will give you up, even though you just helped save them. They will give you up to save their own necks and surrender you to Saul. God foreknew two things that never happened. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. (laughs) If everything is predestined, then how is that possible? Because God is not a liar. God isn't blowing smoke. He he knows, David, you have a choice to make here. If you stay, this is what's going to happen. And if you leave, something different will happen. That completely lines up with everything we've been preaching the last two parts of this series, doesn't it? So what you need to know is foreknowledge does not equal predestination. So when you get a prophetic word, that doesn't equal predestined in terms of it's going to happen no matter what. What it equals is God's revealing the plan, the race that he has planned for you. Are you going to run it or not? And, And here's the interesting thing, that as David is sitting there, he could have said, All right, well, I don't know what's going to happen, so we're just going to hunker down and stay here. Instead, he did the wise thing. I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm going to ask. And as he asks the Lord, the Lord gives him the the download of what's going to happen. The reason this is so important is because you can do it too, and you don't need an ephod and a, a high priest to do it because you have a high priest standing at the right hand of the throne of God who's interceding for you day and night and His Spirit lives inside of you. You are allowed to ask the Holy Spirit, God, I need your help. There's something happening. What do you want me to do about this? If I stay, what's going to happen? If I go, what's going to happen? God, help me. God will answer those prayers. He will answer those prayers. We we've all know there's people that blow it prophetically because they guessed. But there is a time when the prophetic words that are given to you and to me are up to you to be faithful, to go. Because what this shows me is that God foreknows a lot of things. And not all of them are going to come to pass because he knows what will happen if you go this way or this way. Read Jeremiah 18 again. If you repent, I will relent from the plans that I'm devising against you. If you don't repent, then I'm going to continue the plan that I'm doing. There's a choice to be made. God brings it into the realm of possibility because you actually have a choice. I'm drawn very much to the story in the the accounts. I think it's the book of Luke. Forgive me if it's not. It's the, you know how there's the parable of the talents where God gives some a lot, a medium, and then little? Well, I like the other one because God gives all of them the same. He gives them 10, if I remember right. And then he says, go and do business. He put the same amount in their hands and said, go and do business. And so I take account, God, what have you given me? What have you given me? My children, my home, ministry, my wife. What have you given me? And am I going and bearing fruit with all that you've given me to the best of my ability? And am I seeking your face to guide me every step of the way? Am I moving so that you can direct a ship? And I'm going to say this not because I'm truly not trying to make you think differently of me. I'm telling you this story because I was frustrated. 
I remember years ago doing a, the tent revival up in Brainerd, Minnesota, because I was frustrated. God had put in my heart to do international crusades, and I didn't know how to get there. So I called my friends that I know that do international crusades, and I said, dude, I need to get into this because God has put it in my heart, and I don't know how to get from here to there. What am I supposed to do? And guess what? It was closed door after closed door after closed door. No one wanted to help me. No one was coming alongside of me. And so I got frustrated and just looked at my wife and said, I don't know how to get to where God has put in my heart. I just physically don't know how to do this. You asked me to do an event in America all day long. I know what to do. Here's the steps. We get her done. I don't know how to do that in another country that I've never been to. To. I don't know who, who I can talk to that I can trust to handle the money and all the other things that go along with it. I just don't know. So you know what I did do? I did what I know how to do, and we did another tent revival. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this because I'm not going to waste the time sitting at home. I'm going to do what I do know how to do, and I'm going to ask you to direct me. Show me how to get from here to there, but in the meantime, I will not be idle. You know what's interesting? We did that tent revival, and this bald guy showed up named Dave Howard that some of you know, and he came up not knowing me at all. He was invited. He drove up on his own dime to be on our prayer team, and he took me out for breakfast the next day, and he said, Dean, this is great. You need to dream bigger, and I, I looked at him and said, show me how. <laughs> And all of a sudden, what's interesting, yeah, you, you can clap, that's good stuff. Because what I'm trying to show you is that as you go, God directs. And he, uh, it was just a few months later, I was on a plane to Brazil to witness my first crusade, not in the band. And all of a sudden, the, the doors just opened. Now we have so many invitations, I can't take them all. Because the doors just opened. It's amazing what how God can direct you if you just do what you know how to do and ask God to direct you. Yeah. The only reason I met my wife, she's from Oregon, is because I was in a Christian band. Everyone was telling me to quit the band, but we were on tour for a couple months and we were doing this free show in Oregon as a filler day. And me and one other guy in the band, we just knew we were supposed to do the show. Everyone else wanted to cancel it, but we drove through the night. We made it to the show. Guess who I met? My wife. When you do what you're called to do, it's amazing how you come into intersection with the next piece of the puzzle to direct you into the next part of your journey. The worst thing you can do is nothing. That's the worst thing. I'm not asking you to buy a plane ticket and fly across the world just for fun. What I'm asking you to do is follow Jesus and what you do know and allow him to direct you and pull the puzzle pieces together for the things you don't know. Because he will. Amen. He will. If you don't know what God's will is, ask. Test. The last scripture I want to tell you, y'all are going to finish this before I can even finish the verse. I'm not even going to tell you where it is because you're, you're going to know instantly where it is. We're going to test your Bible knowledge. But I want you to listen to this verse in light of everything we just said. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God. Dude, we're talking about Paul, the guy that visited heaven, that experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus. He still had to test the will of God? Seriously? That means that I'm going to have to, too. Amen. So get busy. Go test the will of God. Don't sit there and wait for every perfect thing to open up. Go test. God, is this the door? How do I get here? How do I do that? Get out there and test, because that's how you discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. You want to know what the will of God is and you're not sure? Ask and go test. Do what you know to do and let him direct. Fear is not discernment. 